Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to South Shore. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to worship with us this morning. Uh, this is a safe place where we'll give you some instructions about sitting and standing. Um, we'll ask you to stand at some places. If at any time you would rather sit down, you are of course welcome to do so. Uh, this is a, a safe place to um, worship as you feel called. Uh, and so with that, I'll invite you to stand and we'll start with our call to worship. Good morning, everyone. Our call to worship this morning is a responsive reading. I will begin and you respond with the words in white. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Come, let us celebrate the forgiving, reconciling love of God. For once we were lost and felt so far away, now we have been found and welcomed home. Know that God's love is lavished upon you forever. We rejoice at the news of forgiveness and hope. Amen. <laughs> Some of you might feel very much not alive, and you come here, so you like might feel alive. 
And we hope by the end of the day that you will find the Holy Spirit working and moving through you and in you. Um, this morning we just want to welcome you. If this is your first time here, we're glad you're here. We hope people have extended their um, their hand to you just to let you know. We, um, we have refreshments out here and restrooms in the back and down the hall. And, and uh, we just hope that you just really feel welcome and that you all welcome each other. We have some good news to announce to you. Um, Justin and Andrea Deal uh, have a son, um, Corbin, and they just had last oh. night. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I was, I was laughing at it. I remember when um, my daughter was born and, and I was just looking at Amanda and go, we haven't messed her up yet. And, I mean, she's not messed up yet. She's been perfect in every way right here. And uh, that's the God's love working through us. So be in prayer for um, for the Deal family and, and just celebrate in that new life that's happening. Also, we'll let you know we um, are in the series of the problem of God. We have you've probably seen out there this small group sign-ups, and we hope that you um, uh, get a chance to sign up for those and, and have a chance to, to get in, involved in the small group. How many of you have been in a small group before? Um, and how many of you enjoyed your small group? Yeah, it's always a dangerous question. What you? Oh, no. um, I would encourage you, this is a great opportunity to meet other people if you look for ways of connecting, and it's not a long-term commitment, it's a uh, short-term, so if you don't like the people in the group, it's only a little while. Uh, um, and uh, so this is just a great opportunity to, to grow and walk in, in your faith and really think that community is a way to do that. Um, with that, though, I hope at this point you, you just take the time to pass the piece of fry, say hello to someone. If you see someone you haven't met or haven't seen in a while, say hello.
Uh, if you've served for an hour or more this week, please take a salty service card from the seat back pocket in front of you and place them in the baskets as they uh, as they come around. In addition to our financial tithes and offerings, we also offer our time to uh, to our God in service through the community, through the service here at the church. Uh, so will you uh, join me now as we ask for God's blessing on this time of offering? Holy Father, we submit to you uh, our lives, our hearts, our finances, our time, everything that has value to us, Lord, we, we place faithfully in your hands, trusting not in our own efforts, not in our own ability to predict the future or protect ourselves from harm, but instead we're trusting in your good and perfect character, your generosity, your faithfulness, your extravagant and reckless love for us. We offer this to you in hopes that we might be a blessing to your kingdom. We ask this all in your son Jesus' name. Amen.
Yet we often find ourselves drawn into the dark places in our lives, causing us to lose sight of you. God, in the stresses of our days, we forget to turn to you. And how can we, when all we have to do is look around and see your presence everywhere? When we pay attention, we can see you in the glories of the setting sun, in the kindness of a stranger, in the face of a new babe, in the face of another who needs compassion, in the quiet moments after a busy day, in the gentle touch of loved ones. Lord, you fill the skies with your majesty to remind us that we are a part of your creation. Help us to recognize your glory. Make us mindful of our resources, that we may truly be good stewards of all that is. God, we want to honor you and the gifts of your creation. We don't want to be a people who live in the fearful, angry shadows any longer. Free us, Father. You are our God, and your works are amazingly wonderful. Help us to have faith. Eternal God, we know that you long for us to sing a new song.
Till I see face to face Grace and grace takes me on I trust in you See, we're really not so different We all got issues Some just more easily identified See this one? This one keeps tapping on us And that one? He done lost count he the type that loves rubrics. Like, tell me how to do this, practice makes it perfect. And that one, and that one questions everything. You don't do too well with authority. Like, let me learn on my own. Experience is the best teacher. Let me learn by my own hands. And this one, this one is good visibly. But that one, that one failed miserably. This one got it covered. That one don't need a cover. And this one got it all figured out. <laughs> but so does that one. And this one knows he's better than that one. His filth fills his nostrils. You stink of the lawlessness, selfishness, rebellion, arrogance. But that one knows that this one has been brainwashed. A drone that can't think on his own, so prone to conform. You stink of vain repetition of selfishness, judgment, arrogance. See, we all got beliefs. This one, this one loves the mirror. Spend hours there perfecting his reflection, knowing full well it's lying to him. He just knows that his religious cosmetics would cover up his blemishes. Feeding the poor, helping the need. That's God's airbrush, right? But that one, that one hates the mirror. He's embarrassed of his reflection. He just knows that if he blows it up, he'll be too high to notice, or even care, or question if it matters. Like, why should I believe in a system that feeds a man's ego, right? Since we all got beliefs. We all got issues. They both liars. It's just this one is tired of doing it. And that one thinks he earned it. And that one don't deserve it. But that one agrees. So he believes if I master these 12 steps, perfect this prayer, then I would be okay. And that one agrees that if this one was more like me, we would both be okay. See, we all got beliefs. We both believe in our own means. This one keeps up good deeds. He's involved in social justice. Let me prove it. He has never let a tool click, but he's been so judgmental on souls he's left bruises. As if his filthy rag righteousness makes him any better than that one. Homie, let's say they were both swimming to Hawaii. And this one, this one made it 10 miles. And that one, he made it one. They are both equally dead. See, we all got beliefs. It's just that that one, Believes if I ask for forgiveness, heap up Hail Marys, I'll be worthy of his mercy. We all got beliefs. Problem is we're both wrong. Because at the foot of the cross, the ground is equally level. Participate. All right. Um, so, 
I suddenly got louder. Keep up, keep up, don't put it um, Now, if you did not sin at all last week, put your hands up. You guys didn't sin at all last week? That's if you did not, not sin, if you did not sin at all last week, I was just your friend. You don't have to. I mean, if you didn't, don't put it. Um, and my hand's still up. Now look around. Everyone's hand is still up. Um, some of you might have been thinking, you your hands down. Um, um, <laughs> sorry if I called you out. <laughs> um, some of us might have thought that if I went in the church, the walls would come down. I mean, that, this idea that I, I'm not good enough for church. But here's the secret about church. That there is none righteous, not one. That we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no finger that can point out. Jesus says, judge not, lest ye be judged. I think it's the one scripture that everyone in the world knows. Because um, there's the ones quickly to point it right back at the, the Christians. How do you know, you know that one verse? Like, do you know any other verse? Like, well, we, we have this idea and we start talking about sin and it makes us uncomfortable. What is sin? What does it look like? And... The problem we have, I think, with sin is that it reeks of judgment. Um, it reeks of self-righteousness. And, and we only like to use it when it refers to someone else. And that's that, that, that question of what is it? The other problem with sin is that it's sneaky and it's subversive. And I don't think we really know what it, what it means. It's like in Princess Bride. You know, keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it is. Y'all know this movie, right? If you don't, you can leave now and go watch it, because you should. <laughs> Princess Bride. Um, we think we know what sin is, but we don't know. And Jesus knows we don't know. And so he comes to us to bring light, to shed light on our lives. And that's the, that's the thing about sin. Is so often what happens is... Um, when it, we shine a light on it, we scurry into the dark. It's kind of like the roaches. You shine a light, then they go back to the cupboard. And we get afraid of the light, but the good thing about the light is that it begins to reveal what it is that is in us so that we can get better, that we can grow, that we can become alive. How many of you want to live? Say, just say, I want to live. Are you willing to say that? I want to live. I want to live. Yeah, you sound like Eeyore. Oh, bro. Guess we'll live today. Say that to me now. I want to live. I want to live. I want to live. Show me the way. No, we have this idea, and that's the good news, is that Jesus comes to us and he says, I want to give you life, and I've been saying this, I hope you don't by now, so that you might have it abundantly. That's right, exactly. That's life to give. I hang my life on this, and I want to have that abundant life. Now, throughout my life, discovering what abundance means, um, has changed its form, but to know what real living is. It's the story from the beginning of time of God bringing forth life. And I think one of the reasons we misunderstand sin <laughs> is because of this. And one of the reasons we misunderstand sin is because we misunderstand God. That we don't really know God like we think we do. We're studying this book called Prodigal God. And I know it can seem like a strange title. Um, but the word prodigal, it means reckless, extravagant, and it, it's having spent everything. What I believe is that Scripture shows us that God is recklessly extravagant in His love towards us. That His mission is to bring life to us. Now here's the thing, when God is on a mission and He wants to bring you life, it's not always comfortable. I don't, none of you probably remember your own birth, but it wasn't comfortable. We all cried a lot. We, you know, we came out a bloody mess. It was, it was bad. You remember your child's birth, and, and I think there's a reason we don't have memory to that, um, that moment. And, and I'm sure many mothers wish they did have that memory. And, but it, it's painful sometimes, the birthing process, but through that, we discover why. Life. Life. The first cries, the first laughter, the first hope, the first breath. Sin are the things that keep us from that mission. Sin is the thing that keeps us from God. That's a simple definition. The character of God. In the beginning, God said, let there be and there 
God created light and life from a word. The Aborigines, uh, um, they, they believe that God sung creation into me. I love that imagery of God singing life into being. But here's the thing I begin to think of. It doesn't say, I mean, it says God created light and life. It doesn't say that God created people who will suffer and serve me until I create a nice place of land, a nice piece of land, one day in the future after they've suffered enough. It says he made light with a word. When I start thinking about that idea of God needing me, I, kind of, I wonder if God laughs and need you. I made life out of nothing. What do I need you for? As if God is, needs me to accomplish something. But here's what I realize in the story is that God wants me. He wants you. He loves you. God is, he doesn't need us to love. There's, there, there's an idea out there that, that, that God needs someone else to love. But God is perfect in himself. A perfect trinity. Three in one. He has perfect love in there. He chose. He wants to love you. Call you to life. So we search throughout scripture. We see God creating environments of life. This is the very nature of God from the beginning and for eternity is to create life. As a matter of fact, it's, it's amazing. We see in Genesis just this grand sweep of the, the whole human story. And we have um, very quickly the Israelites find themselves in slavery. Their life is being taken. Humans just taking life from one another, putting each other in, in bondage. And even if it wasn't from their own captors, it's with each other in the, the bitterness between. And so God delivers them and brings them into life. And the first thing he does is he gives the Ten Commandments. Now, we can already we can see and maybe start thinking, oh, he gives you rules on the way. I mean, what's, I'm not a, I don't like rules. I like when other people have rules, but I don't want to <laughs> make the rules myself. And... Uh, it's been kind of my, my tension in my life, but that God, um, the, the goal of the Ten Commandments, though, it wasn't to bring oppression, but liberation. He says, I've forgotten how to live. He says, I want to call you to life. The purpose of the law was not the end. The law was not the end, but a step to life that he was calling us to. So remember this, the character and nature of God is always life. And so if God is opposed to sin, then what is sin? Sin is death. Sin is oppression. Sin is bondage. Sin. Genesis points out this picture of sin. Right in the beginning, you have this, just within a few short chapters, life, creation, life, God creating life. And he says to Adam and Eve, um, we have this very beginning, there's naked people running around. Who says God isn't progressive? Um, and, and here you have this, and then a talking serpent comes in to the picture. Now God told them, he says, look, if you eat of this fruit, you'll eat everything I have is yours. All of this is yours. And stay away from this one tree <laughs> of all of creation. Just my advice is don't eat that, you'll die. Well, the serpent comes in and says, hey, what's up with this tree? And he said, and immediately they start adding rules to themselves. They say, God says, if we even touch it, we'll die. Which he didn't say, if you touch it, you'll die. He said, if you eat it. You see how we begin to quickly put rules and stuff and steps in between us and God. And the serpent says, you know, you're not going to die. He says, you're going to be like God. Would you like to be like God? I mean, it's not a bad question. Who would want to be like God? There's that, that, that question in us. And so there's this idea here of, Will we be like God? Now we can look at this. They bite it, chomp, they're out of it, kick out the pool. Um, and well, right away, we see something. We see sinful. And we say, well, it's a sin. Many of us jump to the conclusion that it is a sin of disobedience. That they weren't obedient to God's rule. They broke his rule, right? So, of course, you break the rules. You don't follow the rules. you got to get out. But I don't think it's about disobedience or about obedience. And the other person might say, what's wrong with wanting to be like God? But well, what is wrong with that? And, and, and so here's where I think the sin occurs. We get a really good picture of sin here. Is that they wanted the things of God, but not God himself. The ultimate thing that separated them from God was that they wanted to remove God from the equation. They wanted to take God out of the picture. It wasn't that they wanted to be like God. It's that they wanted to remove God. 
Everything they had belonged to everything God had belonged to Adam and Eve. And but they wanted the things of God and not God Himself. They were saying they wouldn't need God if they were God themselves. But God is the author of life and of light. And if you take God out of the equation, what happens to light and life? Death and darkness. Something we had here was this picture. Well, Jesus was surrounded by sinners and saints. Sinners and the rule followers. The sinners thought they had no claim on God. The rule followers thought they had the only claim on God. And so Jesus told them this parable that says you're both wrong. You're both missing the point. See, the goal of Jesus, the mission of Jesus, is to show us life. To bring us to reconciliation with God. What life is. And therefore, in order to show and tell about life, Jesus would oftentimes point at death. Go, That's not life. This is. His critiques in this one parable, he critiques two paths that people think lead to life. You have the younger son and the older son. And... Each is the way that people will lead, think that each is the way that people believe will lead to self-worth, significance, and will address the problem of brokenness in the world. Isn't that whatever path we choose to take in this life, aren't we trying to address those things? Our, our self-worth, our significance, and the brokenness in this world. Everything that we do, whether it's vice or virtue, that's what we're, we're trying to address. And so Tim Keller, in his book, he, he surprises looking at this parable of two, two paths he want to talk about. Path one is the younger brother, the younger son. This is a path uh, that Tim Keller calls self-discovery. Self-discovery. I've kind of already said self-discovery was my, kind of my, my path a lot of times. But it, it's the path of discovering oneself and goals regardless of customs and conventions. This view... Color points out, he says, believes that the world would be far better if tradition, hierarchy, prejudices, and other barriers to personal freedom were weakened or removed. Kind of the phrase is, I'm the only one who can decide what is right or wrong for me. I'm going to live as I want to live and find my true self in happiness that way. Seems harmless, doesn't it? Well, I mean to me it does, because I'm that guy. Path two, the older brothers, the path of moral conformity. This view believes that putting the will of God and the standards of the community ahead of individual fulfillment is a way to go. And this is achieved through moral, morally correct behavior. If one fails, one is judged based upon how sorry one is. I'm not going to do what I want to do, but what tradition and community wants me to do. Here's the thing. Is that no one really falls into one of these categories completely. We've seen it in, uh, um, in, in, in news coverage. We, we know in our life that some of the people that, are the, um, that claim to have the highest of moral standards are, and are very judgmental about particular sins are the very ones that are caught in that, that sin. How many times have we seen an evangelist caught doing the very thing that says, this is wrong but for everyone else? Um, and, and that dark secret. Likewise, there are people on the other end that, uh, and, and this is the funny thing about morality, um, is that there's someone who go, I mean, I'm very strong with this, it's very easy for me to talk about drunkenness. I've never been drunk in my life. But here's, it's not out of moral aptitude. I just didn't like the feeling of being out of control. Plus, the girls were more attracted to the sober guy than the drunk guy. You see, I had other issues. <laughs> I had other leanings in my life. I couldn't claim moral superiority. It's easy to not do things you don't like. It's easy to be good at things you like. But here's on the other side. The very, the most liberated of people out there are some of the most, I mean, these are the ones that say, you know, don't judge, they're, they're going to be the first to fight against racism, they're going to be the first to fight against cruelty and bullying, and sometimes they're the first to criticize and put down anybody that doesn't agree with them. It's like having that bumper sticker that says, I hate mean people. Think about it. I I'm angry at people that get angry. The problem with both of these paths is that neither one of them leads to life. They're both paths that set us up to be our own savior, apart from God. You see, in Acts 1, the younger son looked to be his own savior. He was very interested in the father's things, but not the father himself. He wished his father dead. 
And he took his money, went off to do his own thing. And the elder brother, he stayed home and did all the right things. But he also was seeking his own reward. He had no interest in the Father, just the Father's things. Now each one of these people, they came in, and they set their table with their own ideologies, their own morality, their own standards. And they had with them, this is my path of, of uh, a self-discovery and moral conformity. And they came in and said, this is the banquet that I want to have set for life. And this is the way I choose to live. This is how I want things to be. That whole idea is, but apart from the Father, you see, there's, there's no life. You, you end up in the pigsty or you end up angry. We have wondered how often we set up our own moral compass. We set our table up to serve ourselves in the name of serving God with the hopes that we can get God's things but not actually have Christ. But God loves us so much that He comes in. You see, the thing is, it's His table. It's His food. It's His life. It's His offerings. And He says, here, I want to give these to you. But then he sees us doing these things and putting ourselves in bondage. And he has passion for us. He's moved with passion to set us free from this. And he becomes the worst house guest you're ever going to meet. He becomes like when Jesus goes into Jerusalem and he goes to the temple. And he, he sees the thieves in the temple. And he sees us doing the same things. He says, you're putting yourself in bondage. And he comes and he removes all of us. And he wrecks our table. He says, you are killing yourself. You're breaking yourself. You're destroying yourself. Let me set you free. Let me make you whole. He is passionate to make us alive. And it breaks his heart to see us enslaved. You see, he says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want you. I want you. I don't want your sacrifices. I want you. You see, sin is not just about failing to keep rules. It's about following. It's not about following rules. Sin is about the things that keep us from the Father. Ever since we got kicked out of the Garden of Eden, from our own choices, we've been trying to buy our way back in. Whether it's through moral conformity or self-discovery. We've been trying to buy ourselves back into what we call heaven. Like if I do the right things, I'll get into heaven. The problem is if we think we can buy our way in one thing, or we settle for counterfeit heavens, which lead to false uh, emotions and, and temporary um, ideas and experiences. In short, what we've done is we've come to view God as a gatekeeper to heaven. As if he's guarding his stuff. But the truth is, he says, all that I have is yours. God, the product of reckless and extravagant in his love for us, he says, everything he has is already ours. It wasn't the stuff the Father cared about. It was the sons. God isn't a gatekeeper of heaven. Jesus isn't heaven's gatekeeper. Our sin is that we think heaven is the goal. Our sin is that we as Christians think that heaven is the goal of our life. But heaven isn't the goal. Heaven isn't life. Jesus is. God is the goal. Morality, immorality, religion, irreligion, no matter the conviction can separate us from God. The best way to the freedom and life we so desperately long for is found beyond morality. And it's found and resting at the feet of Jesus. That's where your hope is found. If that's the hope you're looking for, I want to pray for you. Can you pray for me? Holy God, we extend our lives to you. We extend our souls to you. And we rest ourselves at your feet. We ask for forgiveness that we try to make gods of ourselves and try to make it our own way. And even when it looked like a good idea, um, Lord, that we've fallen short. But we want to remain in the light and not go back to the darkness. So we extend our hearts to you that you might redeem us, make us whole, forgive us, and to make us alive. Free us, Lord, this day. 
fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, our worship support team is going to come forward, and they're going to pass out our registration passes. And now you'll find two forms, a white one and a, a green one. If you're a uh, regular attender here, fill out the white one if you want to update your information. If you're brand new here, this is your first day. Um, and I haven't scared you off if you want to. But uh, um, fill out the green form. Either way, though, if you're looking for a way to, to make the next step, uh, make a note in here and, and let us know how we can help you in the next step to find yourself at the foot of Christ. Make it real. Make it alive. And would you, as you do this, uh, stand with us as we sing for ourselves?
Go out this day with his love, his light, and his grace, and share that love with all you need. Amen. Amen.